PhD student from Helsinki University, and uh, my main topic is maritime archaeology, and uh, especially the uh, 18th century trade in the Baltic, especially to St. Petersburg. And then I work as an intendant in the, in the National Board of Antiquities. And thank you for organizing the session, and I'm really happy that I was accepted here. So some uh, introduction to the Baltic world and the underwater archaeology of the Baltic Sea. Uh, we call the Baltic, especially the Northern Baltic, to, as a huge underwater museum of shipwrecks and also we have some constructions, for example, from the medieval castles, they had whole barriers and so on, but uh, mostly our underwater cultural heritage is shipwrecks and especially uh, merchant ships from different era. Uh, the oldest shipwreck known in Finland is from medieval, it is late 13th century, but most of the amount of shipwrecks is of course uh, much bigger in the 18th century when the volume of trade grew a lot because of the foundation of St. Petersburg in 1703. And also important harbors were Tallinn, Narva, uh, Danzig, and um, but especially the traffic towards St. Petersburg was quite heavy. As you can see in the corner there, all these red dots are ship, most of them are shipwrecks, like 90, approximately 90% of our, our categorized and registered remains. And at the moment we have like, uh, I think, 1,800 uh, sites in our register and approximately 800, 700, 800 of them are registered ancient remains. That means that they have been, they are sunk before um, more than 100 years old shipwrecks. And why do they preserve? We have these shipwrecks that somebody Cause them like they are from Donald Duck comics or something because our waters are so murky and we don't are uh, the salinity of the water is like from three to six per mil. So the terrier Donalis who eats everything, all the wooden stuff in the more salty waters doesn't it cannot breathe. Sometimes we get some some species with the with the present with the with the tankers and who have this water in the village, but uh, they can breathe there, so uh, we, we don't have that problem yet. And of course, the low oxygen level and, uh, and the lack of light has a big effect. But we're going to archives because we deal with historical archive, it is always that we have to take both into consideration, both archaeological data and archives, and uh, because we have lots of, this is one of the nicest samples, of course. <coughs> uh, most of these wrecks are into quite deep water, so it's still possible to find quite intact wrecks. But maritime archaeology in Finland began already in late 50s, late 1960s. And of course, then maritime archaeological and archaeological methodology was not very well known. And that is why many of the archaeological, so to say, archaeological research was rather salvaged. But it was, it was the way things were handled then, and no documentation was often done, and the reporting was really, it was like notes, and many of these notes or the diaries are not preserved until now. But then shortly aspects of ship's life. Ship's life actually begins a lot uh, earlier than it was built because, for example, in Denmark there were forests that were really meant for growing timber for ships. They even curved the oaks just for building the ships. And, for example, in the Viking Age the ships were usually built quite fast and the Timber was not dried, but when these big trailers were built, the drying phase lasted like two until eight years. So actually, the lifespan of a ship might be really, really long. 
and then the building phase, dockyards, we know several of them uh, along the coastline of Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and of course the Dutch and the British were very big in building ships and the ship industry was really a big issue and that is why uh, going to Russia was really important because they needed the timber, they needed the tar, which is actually many, much of the tar was produced in Finland and in Sweden, and, but uh, uh, St. Petersburg was really important harbor for trading the raw material for rope, sail growth, and the tar and timber, and that is why, and also of course grain to feed the Europeans. But, um, that is why St. Petersburg was really important. And of course, the Danes kept the record, the sound top, tall, tall records uh, from late, late uh, 15th century until mid 18th and uh, mid 19th century. And this archive is one of the biggest, biggest things for the Baltic trade, of course. And now most of the material is digitized. And that is, of course, really, really wonderful also for maritime archaeology. And then there are ship registers in the 18th century. Uh, banking insurance developed, out, especially in the Netherlands and in, in Great Britain. Court orders, because if, if the ship was salvaged or if something happened, uh, many of these cases ended up in court. That is why we even have these uh, written documents and archives in Finland that also consist maritime archaeological record and maritime archaeological uh, inform in, 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 they are actually quite informative and then our uh, salvage records uh, the uh, Swedes for example um, they created uh, salvage companies in uh, founded salvage companies in 18th century, and they kept actually a really strict record uh, of all the salvage operations. Uh, they uh, workers for these salvage companies lived in the in the archipelago. They managed. There was an officer who was leading leading the operations, but uh, these local people were. Um, so to say, they were take, keeping an eye on ships, and uh, if the ship was in trouble, they could actually act quite quite fast. Actually, it didn't consist of styling, but it was like salvaging the ship. The rigging was really expensive. Actually, these salvage companies were founded because they wanted to salvage the rigging, which was the most expensive part of the ship. But then they they understood that also the cargoes of these traders were really really, really uh, valuable and it was a good profit, they gained a good profit, like 25% of the salvage items or even more. And then of course maritime charts, and of course newspapers, Amsterdam Shikuran was probably one of the examples that they made announcement if the ship was, ship was shipwrecked or got into an accident, the announcement went actually quite quickly to the newspapers, for example in St. Petersburg and Amsterdam. Uh, then I go into my case studies. We have um, this case, uh, one of the biggest maritime accidents in, uh, in the Baltic area from the medieval times, it's from six, uh, 1468. Uh, the big hulk. The big uh, left from Travemünde, uh, which was a harbour of Lübeck. Very late in the, it was early winter, there was some restless times in the Baltic and uh, they were afraid of Danish pirates. And this accident was so big that even the maritime legislation was changed and it was not allowed to travel anymore so late in the autumn because they lost approximately 200 people and a huge amount of gold coins, honey, linen, or woolen cloth, which was on, on the way to Tallinn. And there were also noble people. For some reason, many of them were moving back. For example, the uh, <coughs> noble man who was responsible of the medieval castle of Rasabar in Finland, he lost his wife and his son. And that is because of the nobility and the, the value of the cargo. And, and so on. there is quite a lot of archive material in Tallinn and also in Lübeck. And 
this memorial stone existed still in 1787, but now it's lost, but there is a document. There, is a, there was a bishop who was really interested in, in history, and he had written down these things. But then the archaeological find, we have a, the area is like a ship trap. There is a lot of shipwrecks and parts of shipwrecks around. So this combining archaeological data to medieval one is really, really difficult. Of course, we can take dendral dates, but if, even if we find a medieval ship, can it be really be created, this accident? We will see. We will continue surveying on this area. But then to 18th century, this was one of the one of the most important trading which uh, reported trade was called mother trade in the Netherlands because of the rain, but also the, the things I explained before. But Russia has huge uh, huge uh, natural resources, and they uh, the timber was one, but also wax, uh, wax, hemp, um, fur. And uh, then they transported a lot of colonial stuff which was really wanted in St. Petersburg, like clothes, um, dyes for dyeing clothes, and so on. There were tons of uh, sugar, for example. In my example, there were like 40, one of my examples, there was like 40,000 tons of sugar. And of course, it melted away. And the stories tell it was even written down after the accident. and that the seawater was so sweet uh, because the, the sugar started to melt in the water. But uh, like I told, the maritime archaeology in Finland began in the 60s and 50s. And people were very eager to identify these shipwrecks. And they even, some of uh, these historians who were really interested in maritime history, they visited uh, the archives in Denmark, and it was like finding a needle in the haystack. And it is really, really something, um, something that is uh, can be respected. That they traveled all, usually often in their own expense to Denmark, Sweden, France. Even there, there was one Led Seal found from this shipwreck, and the historian went to France to to find the origins of the cloth that was attached to that the Red Sea was leading him to. And of course, but if the identification of the ship is the main issue, you can sometimes be really misled. This is one of the cases from 18th century, most likely really Dutch-looking ship. And all the artifacts relate to Europe. There was porcelain, luxurious stuff. But the historian found two records that could be related to the shipwreck because he found a document from Finland that they that the salvage company had the, one of the staff members of the salvage company had recovered a wooden chest in the winter winter of 1747 1748 and it was sold in an auction so we have the auction record and you could make an assumption that something has happened there and and, uh, and then he found these two documents and the shipmaster was uh, the, this is the toll record but there is also an archive of letters because the diplomats for example the court was usually free from customs and this letter is about the horse carriage and they want they claimed the money paid the toll paid for the horse carriage back and there was a horse carriage in the shipwreck. So that is quite a nice lead. But then all the other stuff found couldn't be related much to the cargo list. So all the mass products mentioned in the toll records, they, are, they were salvaging all the interesting items. And of course, the multidisciplinary research that we now do, like analyzing botany and dye materials and everything, all the chemical analysis, it didn't exist then. And of course, this was something really interesting. Mice and porcelain, pocket watches, most of them frauds actually, but still very high quality. But then nowadays when the 
when the archives are digitized, it is possible, for example, to do name searches and do searches by commodities and whatever, home harbors, destination harbors. And actually, the shipmaster mentioned there before, you could find with the search, white card search, you can find this amount of this uh, Klaus Pierce of Havel is not belonging to the list of the same name appears also later than 14, 1747. So you have to really uh, be careful what you ask from your archaeological data and your historical data. So that was the main point. But I still have one case, but I don't present it now because we have to be scheduled. But research of the cargo nowadays, you can really find some extraordinary stuff. We had coffee beans, dyes, matter, indigo, everything, even raw tobacco leaves from the other wreck. So you really there is possibilities, very good possibilities, to, to do the archaeological research in a way that you can find also this. Uh, related, it can be related to the archives. Thank you for your interest. Okay.